Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. I am unable to see you, which is a shame, but I hope you can hear and see me loud and clear. So as our lovely host uh, announced, my name is Anna Bautic. I come from Croatia, and I will be speaking about certificates and key stores and uh, mostly security in general in Android and, in, and uh, partially iOS. So the talk of the day is sign here. We'll be talking about signing certificates and documents and other things. But before we start, I would just like to point out where I'm currently at. So in pandemic time, uh, we are unable to cross borders, but I would like to thank our hosts and organizers for providing such a wonderful event where these physical borders don't really matter anymore. So you might know Croatia something from uh, uh, Game of Thrones or maybe the World uh, Soccer Championship, but uh, I mostly like the shores and the seaside. So if things are good this year, I welcome you to our seaside. Now let's start with the actual talk. Uh, before we can start in details, we need to define a few things. So first of all, what is a certificate? Uh, most of you don't really think about things like that. Most developers don't think about things like certificates until they're caught up in a situation where they have a huge problem, as I did a uh, long time ago. And, uh, well, basically, a certificate is any kind of electronic document that proves ownership of a key, specifically a public key. Now, it includes information about the identity of the owner. For instance, if I have a certificate, it will include my name, my address, my company, and things like that. And it would also say that it's verified, uh, that the contents of such a document is verified by somebody. Now, it has particular uh, structure. It, uh, it includes electronic signatures and TLS, which you know about uh, probably from network security. Now, as I said, a certificate contains many things like uh, the identity of the user. So it would either be MDEV Camp company, it would either be your personal account if you're the developer publishing for your own or your own company if you're working for a company. Uh, address, city, location, basically anything that identifies you like your personal ID card that you have in your wallet. And I also said that a certificate contains a public key. Now, that public key comes from a pair of keys. One is public, one is private. Uh, we're going to dive a little bit in a rabbit hole, rabbit hole here and just shortly and simply describe what asymmetric cryptography is. Its uh, synonym is for public key cryptography, and it's basically any kind of system, cryptographic system, that uses pairs of keys. Now, PKI or public key infrastructure is a set of roles or policies or any kind of procedures that are needed to create, manage, distribute between people and systems, keys and digital certificates. Now, how do we get those keys? Basically, what we need to do is to calculate them. And this calculation must be computationally economical, which means you don't really have a lot of time to calculate something this secure or, or stable. And again, you don't want somebody to be able to easily kind of break it. That means that you have to find the fine balance between something that can be done and that it's stable and secure enough. Now, the algorithm that is defined between those keys, you can probably choose uh, depending on what you need to do. And basically, the strength of the whole system depends on what was used to, to calculate it. Now, as I said, one is private, one is public. What is very important here is that the private key is exclusively and solely known to the owner, which means if I generate a pair of keys, which are private and public, only I can know what the private key is. The public one can go anywhere, it means that basically I can uh, distribute it to my colleagues, it can be in terms of network security distributed to other servers, basically anywhere you want to show it, you can distribute the public key. That's not a problem. Uh, the other important thing to know is that the private key is usually used to decrypt messages and the public one to encrypt them, which means if I want to establish a secure communication, I will want somebody from the audience, you, to use the public key that I gave you to encrypt the message, but only I, with my private key, will be able to decrypt it. This is how we establish a private conversation where only the information that you send me, I can read. 
And finally, uh, we use the private key to, to, uh, to verify, uh, to verify, just give me a second, to calculate the, the hash or digest, right? Uh, why do we need that? Why do we need signatures? Well, basically, we need to know what signature is in order to use it. Uh, any kind of digital signature that we have online, our online presence, is kind of mathematical scheme that demonstrates the authenticities of a document or a message. Which means if I send somebody a message, they need to be able to verify that I sent it and that nobody modified its contents. And this is what we try to achieve. Now, one purpose obviously is authentication. This is a layer of validation and security for any kind of message that is sent through an online system, meaning when you exchange data from your iOS or Android device towards the server and back. Uh, next is non-repudiation, that's a mouthful. Uh, basically, we need to know that the person who says that sent it is actually the one who sent it. Meaning is that uh, basically, if you send something that's corrupt or that something is invalid, it can mean only one thing, it means that your key was either broken or it means that you deliberately sent it. So there's no third option there. And the third part of any kind of digital signature, obviously, is, as I mentioned, is integrity because we need to know that the contents were altered. If somebody is sending you a message, hey, you got a raise and you got, I don't know, $1 million, we wouldn't want somebody to put, I don't know, half a million or something else there. We need to know that the content is sound and nobody messed with it. So basically, how do we do that? Well, in order to calculate a hash, we use any kind of uh, function like RSA, DSA, elliptical curve, DSA. There are available algorithms to use, and this is somewhere where people usually think, okay, but I can devise my own crypto function. With enough time and resources, yes, but here we don't want to reinvent warm water. You know, the wheel has been invented, it's round, we should use it as is. Uh, okay, now with digital signatures and asymmetric cryptography with pairs of private and public keys, we kind of know what it is, but we still don't know what our, what our certificate is. So we need to go one step back. Uh, with encrypting and decrypting things, as I mentioned before, we use our private key to uh, encrypt things and public key to decrypt. Now, let's go one step back. We have our identity and we have our public key, but anybody can generate that. I can say that I am, I don't know, Greta Garbo, and I can say that uh, I have a public key, but who will you know, vouch for me? Who will say, yeah, she really is who she, is. she says she is, and that's her key. Well, we need a third party or an entity, and it's called a certificate authority. Basically, any kind of entity that people have agreed to that has basically authority in this matter will come and say, okay, we are able to confirm that any kind of user or person or company or entity and a particular public key match each other. And once we sign their whole uh, document, then it means that they have been verified and we can trust them. So basically, a certificate authority is any kind of trusted entity that issues digital certificates. Now, nobody can just say, okay, I want to be a certificate authority, and people will say, okay, you can be it. There is a rigorous program with uh, many, many uh, criteria that must be verified and confirmed for you to become a certificate authority. There are several out there that you have probably contacted if you ever needed to issue a certificate for your particular website or something else and they operate on a particular certificate authority membership meaning that once you're out of that membership that probably means that all the certificates that you generated are no longer valid or can will be distrusted at some point in the future and those certificates that are issued they are trusted by web browsers by your macbook computer by your android and iris device and they are the basis of the communication online regardless how you want to put it to draw one parallel, the certificate you got in school, you know, your parents didn't sign it, your colleagues didn't sign it, your neighbors didn't sign it. The authority for that particular college signed your certificate from college. 
meaning is that we have an established entity that says, okay, we can verify the data and we vouch for that person that they actually, you know, got an A for math or physics or something else. The same applies to network insecurity. So what does a certificate authority do when they come into existence? Well, they create the certificate and they sign it themselves. Now, this seems kind of, you know, like a recursion, but this is the cornerstone of all things related to certificates. Once uh, an authority exists, they have to be able to say, okay, this is my root certificate. I'm generating it. It states that I'm who I am and I can sign and verify other certificates with that particular root certificate. Now, uh, those basic, you know, information like certificate authorities, your browsers, your Android device, your iOS device, they know who they are. So when you get that annoying pop-up, okay, please update your browser to the newest version because we have some kind of security patch, chances are that the list of, you know, certificate authorities that are trusted and not trusted anymore have been changed. So you need to update that. And that's, that's one of the reasons we have so many attacks and uh, 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 basically malicious attacks in, in the world because people tend to forget that they need to update to be secure. Now, uh, just a few of them are like Komodo, Identra, Symantec, GoDaddy, Let's Encrypt. Uh, most of them are commercial, meaning you will have to pay a hefty sum to get your certificate. Or oh, Let's Encrypt doesn't fall into this category. My husband used it uh, several occasions and uh, it can either go smoothly or you can have uh, lots of problems with it. So. Uh, for those of you who have used it, I have gotten really, really mixed results. Oh, it was great. It was horrible. But you should try it for yourself if you need it. Now, if you open any kind of browser, let's say Google.com, uh, you can see the certificate or you can read the data by clicking in the tab bar on the little icon with the lock or the name in the left top corner. And basically, it will show you what, what the certificate information is. Now, this is an old screenshot, uh, quite old, actually. Uh, it says, says that uh, Google.com is issued uh, by Google Internet Authority G2, and the certificate is valid. And you can see details here, like the country, state, locality, organization, etc. And if you keep scrolling, you can look in your own browsers, of course, because this is only a short subset of information. You get the Syrian number number, you get the the uh, algorithms that were used to create the keys and et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you take a look at the top part, you see that we have Google.com and above it is Google Internet Authority. What, what happens here is that we have not just one certificate, but a chain of certificates. And this is necessary because we will eventually get to the point where, you know, some things can go wrong. And once things go wrong, we cannot basically be in the situation where we need to kill all, all our websites and hosts, etc. Uh, but we will get to that a little later. Now, just let's look at the Google Internet Authority part right now. Again, we see the subject name, we see the information that the certificate is valid and that it's issued by, by uh, in this case, um, GeoTrust. Now, if we take one step upwards, we get to the part that's really interesting, GeoTrust Global Certificate Authority. Now, this is the root certificate. What we saw was the root, intermediate, and the leaf certificate. And this particular one that we're looking at is the one that was issued by the certificate authority. Now, GeoTrust issues many certificates to many companies. And we want to be sure that if there is a, you know, a leak of a private key to one of them, that if we just exclude that one, that everything else will be okay. So we don't compromise the whole tree. Now, if we just take a look at the chain of what it looks, so certificate chains are used to basically defer responsibility and mitigate risk on the, on the network. Uh, root certificate uses its public key to verify the digital uh, signature of an intermediate certificate. And the intermediate certificate in turn verifies the signature of the identity certificate. So that would be google.com. Uh, there aren't 
many differences between uh, certificates in general, but you can get a domain versus extended validation type. Now, they do the same thing. They confirm the identity, but the effort needed to get an extended validation on a certificate is usually much, much bigger. Uh, there are more checkboxes to take. There are more information to provide. Both ensure privacy, but one is more detailed or to be or to be exact. Uh, one provides more, I don't know, clarification. Uh, what is very, very problematic in this whole system, although it seems like a great concept and generally it is because all the network communication is based on it. The main verification is prone to attackers. Uh, and this is problematic because uh, when you need to verify your identity at some point, uh, let's say that your certificate authority might send an email to you. It might assume that it will get the uh, responsible person at, I don't know, admin at google.com or root at google.com, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes these email addresses aren't really you know, secluded to a company or private or, or not available to general public. Sometimes they give these addresses to anybody and uh, that could cause a lot of problems. Uh, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So my question here, if we take a look at the whole system, I know we have private and public keys, we take care of them and we know that uh, everything should be fine, but you know, are we, uh, I don't think that anybody put this better uh, except Scott Hanselman when he said that basically HTTPS and SSL don't really mean trust this. It means that the whole communication is only private. And this, this is very funny uh, turn uh, in his tweet because basically he's correct. We only know that nobody can listen to our conversation, but in the end, we might be talking to the person who we are talking to, or it may be somebody else completely. This, this must have happened to you once or twice in your lifetime. Now, the problem is subversion. Uh, any kind of man-made system is prone to errors because we are prone to errors, and so is this. Uh, what to subverge is to overthrow, meaning that in uh, 2001, uh, Verisign issued two certificates to Microsoft which weren't Microsoft. I think it was a scheme where they sent, you know, private information to one of those email addresses, assuming that the responsible person at Microsoft will be getting them. But it turns out that it was a random person who just happened to get, you know, admin at Microsoft or something like that. Uh, and uh, something similar happened to Komodo and DigiNotar in 2011. Uh, I believe that Trustwave issued uh, certificates, uh, a subordinate group certificate that was used later on in men in the middle attacks. So basically any kind of main made system is prone to errors and this happens, you know, we cannot avoid this. So what happens is key theft. When this happens, uh, if you own the private key, you can wreak havoc to the whole system. The scheme is flawed again, because people are behind it. You know, it's not a bulletproof system. And again, uh, where you store your keys is very important. So, if you ever heard of HSMs, it's uh, it's a shortcut for hardware security modules. Those are top secret James Bond uh, Mission Impossible black boxes or gray boxes that are stored in weird places like you know basements, uh, behind locked doors. They have you know lasers and stuff uh, that uh, that notice any kind of movement, any kind of temperature shift. And the point behind this is that. If something happens to this box, if somebody steals a hardware security module with private keys for a bank or a government, we need to make sure that those keys get destroyed before they can use them. So what happens if you shake the box or you don't provide, you know, three keys that are turned simultaneously in one microsecond and stuff like this, uh, the box will detect either movement or a change in electricity or and it will erase its contents. And this is how we keep it safe. And of course, the safest way to keep those keys, regardless of what you do, is offline. Because if you cannot get to them, then nobody can get to them. Now, let's take a look at Android for a second. Uh, Android as a platform will try to keep you safe despite it being open source and open in general, and developers can do really what they want to do. 
if entry detects communication with an unknown certificate authority, somebody who just joined the club and wasn't basically added to the list of certificate authorities, or if you sign a certificate yourself and add it to a website and try to communicate, Android will say, no, it's not going to work. And installing certificates from a particular website on the device was possible before Android N, but after Android N, you basically need to provide network security configurations that will say, okay, trust an unknown uh, certificate authority or trust a self-signed certificate. Uh, this leads to certificate pinning. If you've ever worked with a larger client, they might have asked you, okay, we have some really serious, really monetary related uh, stuff here. Please pin our service certificates in your app. Now, this is possible and people do this and it's generally a good idea until your client decides to change the service certificate without notifying you. Then you can get a phone call at 6 a.m. with the screening client on the other side saying, wait, everything stopped working. The Android app isn't connected to anything. We have you know, a drop in production. What do we do? And what happened? They changed the certificate and your application that has the old certificate pin is basically saying, no, I don't trust the new one. I cannot connect to that. So it's, it's, it's easy to shoot yourself in, in the foot so if you're pinning certificates in your application, you either need to have several of them pinned, you like, uh, like a backup that might be exchanged on the server, or you need to have a really, really good relationship with your client where you know that you will be notified in advance that the certificates will be changed. Uh, Android would also tell you that it cannot connect to uh, API or a server if there's no intermediate certificates on, on, on that server. So that means that the whole chain of certificates must be present and everything in that process must be clean, uh, which is good. Uh, but like I said, this whole approach to certificate pinning can really blow up in your face if you're not extremely, extremely careful. careful. Uh, now, in terms of mobile applications, I will be talking more about Android than iOS, but the same concept applies. Android requires all the builds that you create to be digitally signed with a certificate. Now, when you create a debug build, you know, click run on Android Studio and it just produces an APK, it is signed with a digital certificate, but you basically didn't need to do anything. Your, your Android uh, environment created the certificate and provided all the data necessary. Uh, this particular build can never end up on Google Play, and Google Play basically denies, uh, they won't allow you to upload it because that particular certificate is the one default in your SDK. You know the password to it, it's Android, everybody knows it, it's a it's, uh, certificate that you get. And basically, if you want to create a build that goes on Google Play, you will need to create a dedicated certificate for it, or you will get the one from your company that's used to sign all the applications. We will get to that a little bit later. That's another foot gun that can blow up in your face. So we need to generate a key and a key store in order to provide a signed build. After we do that, we need to sign the application. And after that, we can push it to Google Play or anybody anywhere else uh, for testing purposes. Now, for those of you who have ever signed, this screen looks probably very, very familiar. Uh, you need to provide a new key store. The, the Android Studio will provide the data itself. You just need to enter the password and alias. Uh, uh, one thing that can go wrong, some people like to toy with the validity and put, I don't know, one year or two years. The problem here is when that time span kind of expires, your certificate will expire, to, uh, expire with, as well. And that will create a huge problem for you. Now, once you have that certificate done, you can sign your APK with it. Now, if you created your certificate a long time ago, you can just use it or you can use the one you just created. If you don't like to use the user interface, you can always fall back to the console and the tools that are available for like keys tool, zip line or jar signer to sign your uh, APK and then generate before that generate the key and then align your APK. Now, in terms of iOS, again, 
if you create uh, a build, you won't be able to install it just like that. You will need an enterprise certificate. So you as a developer will get the certificate from the App Store or the developer console. I'm not sure what the location is. But again, the concept applies. You need to know who the owner of the APK is, and it needs to be signed in any way. Uh, one of the great questions that you will face, or you have faced if you had problems with this before, is the responsibility of that particular private and signing key. Uh, what used to be the situation is that we, the developers, were responsible for it, meaning that I created the key store, I created uh, I signed the APK and I pushed it to Google Play. But we don't always stay at the same company and generally things can go wrong. What you expect from the whole system is that you will be able to update your application throughout its lifetime. If you're creating an application for mobile banking or Facebook is probably expecting it to at least a few more years, you need to be able to update it. And you won't be able to update your APK if you sign it with something else other than the first uh, certificate. So we want to be able to update it for its lifetime. For that to be possible, we need our signing key to be safe. We need it to be accessible, meaning we need to be able to get it. And the whole concept basically works like a castle in a moat. Uh, the more people can get to the data, the more exposed the castle is. If nobody can get to the data, then again, you cannot answer, enter the castle. The same falls, uh, the same principle follows here. Uh, in reality, and this is from personal experience from a company I used to work with, uh, people spill coffee and they move to other companies. Now, there was an application that needed to be updated a long, long time ago. And uh, I had the misfortune of uh, being given this task because uh, there was a problem. So one of my colleagues uh, worked on an application. He started from the beginning. He created it. He uploaded it to Google Play, you know, pushed everything to Git. And a few years later, he switched companies. He left. In the meantime, he, he was kind of clumsy. He did not leave the company because he was clumsy, but he did spill coffee on his MacBook at some point in time. And that MacBook kind of went to storage. We didn't get rid of it. You know, it just kind of, okay, happens. Uh, not the first time, not the last time. And we started work again on that application. We added a feature. We were ready to publish. The client was happy and content. And at the time we got to the publishing, it wasn't really possible because the location of the key store that was created was nowhere to be found. Uh, after reviewing Git, we see that the date when it was committed, but the only thing that was committed was the location that was nowhere in the project. And one more comment here. Please don't commit your key store and data to the Git repository of the application. You know, you can transfer it to a client at some point in time. It's just not good practice. Keep them separate somewhere and have a backup, you know, because it can really go wrong as it did in our case. So what happened in this uh, situation, we got really, really lucky because that MacBook was still in our premises. And we managed to get a hold of our colleague, and he gave us his password. And with lots of lots of trouble, we managed to get to the key store, put it in safe storage, and resign our application, push it online. But uh, the scare and the panic uh, that goes along with you basically having to tell your client, "Oh, we made a problem. We made a boo boo, in lack of a better word, and we won't be able to update your application, and basically we're costing you money." and your reputation will kind of go to shreds, that, that's a problem. And you don't really think about it until it kind of happens to you, as we particularly did. So what happened was that Google noticed this uh, because, you know, companies are small, but there are bigger companies and bigger places that have the same issue. And they said, OK, we got a solution for you. You surrender your signing keys to us, and we will then take care of this, the, the publishing process. And this was great for old and new apps, uh, because now you were able to just create an upload key. You uploaded that signed key that you used, and you registered the signing key. And that was it. So basically, Google said, OK, you're taken care of. We will make sure it doesn't get lost. I mean, if they lose it, the whole system kind of falls in water to begin with. 
Uh, and for the existing apps, you, again, submitted your signing key and created an upload key, and you continue signing your application with the upload key. What you need to know is once you decide to say, okay, Google, you can kind of use my keys and I'm relinquishing my, my authority here, the decision is permanent. So you cannot undecide to, to give them control for this. And now what happens if your key gets lost or compromised like it almost did in our case? Well, basically Google will say, okay, we will reset your upload key. And if you're not enroll, enrolled in signing by app with, by Google Play, and if you lose your key store, you'll need to publish a new app with a new package name. And that's a they mitigate the whole process, which is good. So once you've decided who will be responsible for the signing key, and in this case, my my personal choice would be definitely Google, you need to decide whether you will use it for all your modules, applications, or something else. Uh, pros and cons are very, you know, simple. You need to decide for yourself. Basically, it's modularity if you want your application to be you know to be able to communicate with parts of it if you want to share some kind of uh, data and you're basing it on permissions or if you want to update things if you use the same key again the con would be of meaning that if something happens to that key it all falls in the water so your own personal choice Holes here. You need to decide what suits your company and your business requirements in the end. Now, what about the key store itself? Now, Android has a key store system and it's basically used to manage, basically safeguard your cryptographic keys from extraction. What was what uh, what is a kind of uh, obvious attack would be to when you have private keys on your device uh, in your application because you're encrypting something. A possible attacker might want to get to those keys and then use it to, I don't know, decrypt communication or steal data or something like that. And Android has a system that is devised exclusively to keep that safe. Uh, once, once you put the keys in the key store, basically uh, it's non-exportable. You cannot get it out ever, ever, ever. Uh, you cannot even change the use of those keys. For instance, it might be for signing, it might be for you know encrypting, but basically you cannot change the function. Uh, and uh, uh, the key store system that was used in the key chain API, as well as the key store provider feature, they were introduced in Android 4.3, which means that before that, this was not available. Uh, we'll get to why that's a problem a little bit later. But first, the First question you need to add, ask yourselves regarding mobile apps, should you keep any kind of sensitive data? And basically the thing you need to know here is that there is a diagram where you need to decide for yourself whether that data is important or not. If the data is important, don't keep it there. If the data isn't important, then you need to add it Obviously, you don't need to add it to your application. So if it's at all possible, please do not keep any kind of private or sensitive data within the mobile application. So extraction prevention is something that uh, enables that to, uh, basically key material that you put in the keys or anything else, they are bound to the secure hardware. So there's a part of hardware within the device that has uh, that's called trusted execution environment, TEE, or secure element, SE. Uh, it's never exp the key is never exposed outside of that hardware, meaning that if you need to check something, okay, is this key okay, is, or is that data okay, you basically query that part of the hardware, and they, they will just say yes or no. You cannot get to the data itself, and you cannot modify it or use it or anything else. So basically, if you want to check uh, whether this is, this is available or not, then you, you need to ask a few API questions. So one thing to just keep in mind is that once you define something, it's immutable. It cannot be modified. It cannot be changed. Uh, it also can be checked uh, that once you query something, that it's a valid information is valid only like for one minute or two minutes or three minutes, which kind of reduces the time span where somebody could try to get the, to the same information that you're trying to get to. And of course, uh, user authentication where you need to authentic authenticate yourself on the device with a PIN code or face ID or something else to be able to get to that data. Uh, 
So the utility methods that are available in Android since API 23 is basically key info is inside security hardware, which is just a yes or no. And key info, and now this is a mouthful, is user authentication required requirement enforced by secure hardware. Now, naming is hard. I'm sure you've always uh, at least sometimes had a problem with naming variables or something like that. Uh, Google is no exception here. So this is a really, really long method. But basically, it lets you check whether some kind of private key is bound to the hardware that 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 you know that will be secure and uh, not retrievable. So this returns true if the requirement can be used and the user has been authenticated and it's enforced by the secure hardware, that's TEE or SE. Now this was added API 23. Uh, you can choose whether or not you will use the keychain or Android keystore provider. Again, keychain was introduced in API 14 and in this case, you need to you get the ability to have system wide credentials or system provided UI. So, you know, everything's the same uh, for the key store provider. Again, you have app specific credentials. You have no interactions. It's all under foot and it's available from API 18. Now, it obviously is a different experience and you might want to keep track what you allow the users from 14 and from 18 to see. But it's always good to have this in place regardless of what you're doing so it's a little what more work but in the long run it's it's a good thing now what we need in any kind of use uh, of cryptography and keys we either generate a pair of keys which will be used later on we need to list existing entries to check whether something is added or is available or not we sign data for instance we're saying sign, sending a message and we need to sign that message or we verify signature on particular data to see that it's correct. Now, you might think that in terms of security and privacy and everything else, that this requires a lot of code, but it's actually just a few lines. So to generate a key pair in Android, you have just a few lines of code. In this case, the key pair generator will create an instance based on the algorithm that you want to use, and you will provide it with an alias. Once you initialize it, with another alias, you will need to define what kind of purpose it's for. Is it signing? Is it verifying or something else? You will be able to choose what kind of digests it uses. So it's either SCAR256 or uh, 5112, and then you will build it. And after that, your key pair is created. So that's very little code for us to create a key pair. Uh, when you want to list entries, again, even less code, you create the key store and you get the instance by the alias that you provided. You load the data and then you're able to list aliases in some kind of enumeration. If you want to sign data, and this is the more common use from what I've seen, you create a signature and you get that instance by what you want to use to uh, sign it with. You initialize it with the private key that you already have. You update the data, and the data is basically any kind of message or document that you want to sign. And at the end, you get the signature in a byte array, and you're done. If you want to verify signatures, and this is also a common approach, uh, signature is basically an instance with what you use to sign it. Uh, you initialize the verification, but by the private key entry and the certificate that's contained. You update the data with it, and you get one Boolean at the end, whether or not it's verified. So it's simple. You don't toy with the data. You don't change it. You just get the, the information whether or not it's correct. And if your actions within the app depend on whether the signature is correct, for instance, you get the notification from the bank, oh, your, your overdraft, ha overdraft has been approved, you get another 2,000 euros to spend, then you need to be sure that the data was, uh, that the data that was sent for the bank might be, uh, that the integrity of the data is still okay. Now, uh, key attestation is one uh, other process that's used to give you more confidence that the keys that you use in your app are stored in the device's hardware back key store. But, this process, although great and very useful, only a small number of devices running from Android 7, and that's API level 24, support this kind of attestation. 
all older devices and other devices from that AP level, they don't have it. They use software level key attestation. Software always is less secure than hardware. So this is a problem because there's there's a lack of standardization and it would be much better for the end users and you to be able to have the security that this is available in all the devices. And we know that the Android market is huge and you know it would be too costly to put it everywhere. So it's kind of, uh, you know, a scale you need to weigh what's more important so it checks whether key is stored in a hardware back key store and again small number of devices so from android pi uh, uh something called key rotation was introduced and uh strongbox key master hardware security module so we have lots of improvements with every fpl level that comes comes onward uh with android and I'm sure that more things will come to follow that are even greater in the future because we see that the security in Android has been improved drastically in the last uh, five or six years. Uh, but to be fair uh, and honest to you and the end users, the state of Android regarding this is basically, you know, in shatters because the more users you want to uh, in, enable to use your application, not all of them will have the same level of security and privacy within the app, which means more work for you, but in turn, you'll be able to, to provide at least some kind of security to your users. And again, you need to be able to pick the right tool for the job. And basically, you need to assess whether you need to use something or not. If your application is lightweight and you know this kind of security really isn't important and you're not keeping anything sensitive, then you might need to bother yourself with this. If you're handling money or private data or information that might be misused by anybody else, then you need to put in more work uh, towards security. So because just because you have a hammer doesn't mean that everything is a nail. So best effort. Uh, if you want to check the security and the level of, um, I don't know, privacy that you have in your communication, you can always uh, send this link to your uh, customers and tell them, okay, check the check the grade that your certificates and your website is uh, getting. It can be anything from A plus to I don't know B, C, D, and the rest. Uh, it can really help your users to solidify their security, and generally, you can point out when there are problems with particular aspects of uh, your future self app. So. I personally hope this was uh, interesting to you. I hope that certificates in general are a little more familiar now, and I hope that uh, you will be able to use at least my experiences, which some were good, some were bad in the future, and maybe have better luck. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. That was very comprehensive. And we have one question from Slido. So uh, our attendee asks, is it safe to just verify root certificate of CA to be sure that communication is private? Uh, so uh, generally, from Android standpoint, the whole chain will be verified. Uh, root CA yeah it's it's it will say whether or not the the certificate authority certificate was compromised or not but it doesn't generally verify that the intermediate certificate or the identity certificate were not compromised for instance if a company were to lose its private key and now the identity certificate would be able to i don't know generate another pair or uh, another certificate or something else then this whole branch would need to be cut off so just checking the root is is in terms of android it's not enough you need to verify the whole chain mm -hmm. thank you and we just received another question uh have you used secure shared preferences any thoughts on that so colleagues that are working uh, both in the previous company and this one are using it uh shared preferences in general tend to allow safe store uh storage of items that aren't, you know, really complex. So you cannot put, you know, lots of data inside. It's just simple stuff. Uh, from our perspective, we wouldn't ever, ever put anything too important there. So anything that's, you know, that's 
problematic or that could be used, you'd want to keep it off the device because even if if you keep it in something like that, again, you can boot your device, especially on Android. iOS has a different kind of approach to security in general. Uh, once you root to your device, basically everything that's on it, except the hardware part, is available to misuse. So it's it's a good thing to check and to try, but uh, if it's not really critical and if it's completely irrelevant, again, you shouldn't keep it in your app. So that would be the general advice. Thank you very much. Please, Anna, I would like to ask you to go to our 3D World app for 15 minutes to meet our attendees and chat with them if they have any more questions. Today, you can also fly in the world, so that's a new feature. Um, and for yeah. the rest of you, please uh, rate Anna's talk. We collect ratings. Um, and also, the next talk in 15 minutes uh, will be very interactive. Uh, you should have received instructions how to prepare for the next talk uh, in your emails uh, because you need to, or you, it would be nice if you um, filled in a questionnaire that is uh, a part of the next speaker's talk. So you can do it during the break. It takes about 10 or 15 minutes to fill in and you should have the links in your emails. Uh, and the talk will be very interactive. We will ask many questions and we would like uh, you attendees to answer all those questions and help us with um, the talk and um, to make it a little bit more interactive. So, uh, Anna, thanks again. And uh, I will see the rest of you in 15 minutes. Goodbye. Bye.